when one kid bullies another, one child suffers. When a teacher in a classroom doesn't care, 20 children suffer. When a whole education system is broken, millions suffer. Today, there's one system that is broken, and it affects everyone. Now, to answer the question, which system that is, I'll take you back a couple of years to a meeting I had with my friend Alex. We were meeting up in a bar. We hadn't seen each other for a long time, and so he gave each other a warm hug. As it turns out, you say, oh, hold on, can't do hugs anymore. This was before COVID. And so I meet Alex, and he was smiling and radiant. And then I say, Alex, how are things? How's life in California? And then his face turns, and he, you see the, the, the pain and the suffering. And he explains, he says, I had to leave California. I have to leave Silicon Valley because I had to close down my business. And I'm not going to try to be an entrepreneur anymore. I'm giving up. And as he's explaining what exactly has happened, on the TV screens in the bar, we see a news report on stock markets reaching new highs. It was the Dow Jones at that point reaching 25,000. And the news anchor was talking about how great this was for the economy, how thriving the economy is. And, and Alex is just shaking his head and he says, no, no, not for me. This doesn't do it for me. I didn't feel that striving economy uh, uh, these years. And the bartender who brings us the beers, he'd been hopping in and out of the conversation, says, I don't feel it either. I've been doing this job since 2004, and the wage I take home today is exactly the same wage as back then. So how can it be that on the one hand, we have a stock market that's going through the roof, that's higher than it's ever been, and at the same time, entrepreneurs like Alex and people who work in a bar like the bartender don't see any of that. And the answer is because the system is broken. And the system that's broken is the market economy because there's a handful of firms that are large that are making enormous profits, and that's why these stock market valuations are so high. But these firms are making profits because they don't face competition. There's no one really entering into their markets to try and challenge their market share, to try and get some of the profits that they're making. Because that would lower their prices, but they don't have to do that because there's no one there. Now, this has enormous consequences for the rest of the economy. It causes inequality and it causes polarization. And these are two of the biggest challenges that society faces today. So what is going on? Well, if you look at the data, think of a firm, the pie that it generates is being divided between workers and what you buy in terms of machines and innovation and what's left over is profits. And in the 80s, the profits were around 2%. Today, the profits are 14%. There's a huge increase in these profits. And that's only to, a large, to the small number of large firms, not to all firms. It's only these dominant firms who grab all these profits. Now, the story of the bartender is not just the story of one person. We see that this is very much throughout the entire economy. If you look at wages starting after the Second World War, and we compare how wages have evolved, Compared to productivity, what is productivity is just how much the average worker produces. Now, the wages of those workers who do production jobs and service jobs, they used to evolve at the same rhythm, but from 1980 onwards, wages have stagnated. They haven't kept up with productivity growth. And this is the case for most workers in the economy. The same is true for Alex. This is not just the story of one person. Alex's story is heartbreaking. He had developed a new technology. It was a way to have better peer-to-peer -peer communication between mobile devices. And this technology was of interest to some of the big mobile device producers. They wanted to implement it in their models. And what happened is they talked to him for two and a half years. They exchanged all the information, the software, how he did it. They drafted a contract. They even came to an agreement about what the price for the technology would be. And last minute, 
the deal fell through. Alex later learned that the engineers have collected enough information from him to just implement it themselves. They didn't need his technology anymore. And that completely discouraged Alex from starting up again and trying a new startup again. And his story is not just the story of one person. It's the story of the economy. You would say, well, we're living in a time of fast technological change. There must be a lot of startups. There were, in the 1980s, there were about 14% of all firms were startups. Today, that has fallen to less than 8%. That's a big fall. That means that there's nearly less than half of the startup firms than we had in the 80s. And startups, they're really the building blocks. They're like these Legos. And what is a Lego? Lego, well, I have to admit, as a child, I always loved Legos. I've always played with Legos. Even as an adult, I went to Denmark to Legoland, and it's amazing what they can do with these things. I've had a love for Lego, except once when my daughter left the Lego on the floor and I stepped on it barefoot. That was the once I questioned my love for Lego. But these Legos are really the symbol of these startups, because startups are the building blocks of the economy. We have half of those now. And why are they the building blocks of the economy? Because startup firms, they innovate more. Startup firms, they hire more workers, especially younger workers. And startup firms grow faster than regular firms. So if we have half of those, the entire economy is going to be affected. And this is going to lead to slower growth and slower innovation. So how could we get there? Why is it that these dominant firms were able to dominate their markets. And this is a story where fast technological change is the central character in the movie of the economy, but that character, that fast technological change, is both the hero and the villain. It's the hero because we need technological change. If you look at the 80s, what all these firms who were first in their markets did was path-breaking. It innovated and it changed the way we do things today compared to how we did it 20, 30, 40 years ago. That's an enormous change, and that's the hero part. But there's also a villain part, and the villain part is that these same firms use that same technology to keep competitors out. And why is it the key word is scale? If you think about a company like eBay, eBay is a platform where you can buy and sell anything from art to used books. And on a platform, what you want is that there's a lot of users. As a buyer, you want to be where the sellers are. And as a seller, you want to be where the buyers are. And that's just volume. That's just large size. So it makes no sense to have two small platforms. The best thing is to have one big platform. Scale is important. And so what an eBay did, of course, was the hero part. They invented this new technology. But the villain part is that they can keep any competitor out. Yahoo Auctions has tried for many years. They could never do it. Why? Because no one wants to switch to a platform where no one else is. And that lets eBay charge fees of 6, 7, 8%, whereas their cost is much lower than that, it's less than half a percent. But they're not challenged in that pricing because no one can get, in, can get into this market. No one can be as big as they are. And this is not the first time we see this. We saw this also in the 1900s. What happened then was there was fast technological change, and the technology then was railway transportation, electricity, oil exploration. The firms that were first in the market were the heroes. They developed new technologies. They developed new markets, which was great. We could cross, you know, say, from the east to the west in the United States much faster, much more comfortable because of rail transportation. But at the same time, there was also no competition, and this led also to wage stagnation, this led to much less innovation. And this had an impact on the entire economy because it led to inequality and it led to polarization. But we know how that ended back then because we needed two world wars and one Great Depression to get rid of these dominant firms and the negative consequences they had. Now we can do a lot better than that. There are ways to solve that. And the short answer for the solution is to have more competition. We need much more competition. 
But we need to keep the size of these platforms, for example, if these networks, we need the scale advantages, but we need at the same time competition. And one way in which we can do this is by separating the two. And there's a great example that's in action right now. And that example is the mobile phone plans that you have here in Europe compared to the United States. My plan with AT&T in the United States States cost about two and a half times what it costs here in Europe with Movistar. And why is that? The technology is the same. I use the same device. It's 5G, 4G in both uh, cases. The cell towers are the same. There's nothing different there. There's one piece of regulation that's different. And that piece of regulation says that in the European market, any owner of a network must allow any entrant to use that same network. So if I have a small entrant, think of it as a firm like Alexis, and they want to enter in this mobile phone market, they don't have to invest in a huge network, which is very expensive. They can just use at a fee, they can rent the network of someone else. And as they do it, this is going to lead to entry and, of course, lower prices. And that's why the price here is so much lower than it is with AT&T, because AT&T is not forced to take any competitors on its network. Now, this is not just for mobile phone plans. This also works for your social media platform. This works even for the network of beer distributors. This works for retail and textiles. This principle of separating the network from the providers creates competition while keeping the benefit of the large scale. Now, next time, next time you hear a report about the stock market reaching new highs, the Dow Jones will reach 40,000 at some point. Who knows where it will end up? Next time you hear it, think twice. Think twice because it's not good news. It's a sign that the system is broken. And the system is broken because it causes startups to decline, it causes wage stagnation, and eventually it affects everyone because it generates inequality and polarization. And history tells us that this can end in disaster. But as they say, history rhymes, it doesn't repeat. We are responsible to make sure that history doesn't repeat. We have to do that, and we can. We can do that because we can ensure that there's more competition, we can separate the network from the providers, and we can foster innovation by having more of these startups like Alexis, because they are the building blocks of the economy. Thank you very much. <laughs>